Let me introduce myself. I'm Bob Rydell. I'm a professor of history here at MSU, director of the MSU Humanities Institute, and this year I'm wearing another hat. I am the president of Phi Kappa Phi, the MSU chapter of the National History Honors Society, and I'm very pleased to welcome you to this Phi Kappa Phi Forum. This is a forum sponsored by the Honors students. The theme is the human prospect in a time of profound concern about the future of the planet. And we have some very, very distinguished guests to visit with us this morning to share their thoughts. Um, I could spend literally, um, in fact, I wouldn't have enough time, the next hour and 15 minutes, um, reading from their resumes, and I still wouldn't get through them. Um, so I'm not going to read from resumes, um, but I do want to say a few words about um, our guests and especially about um, Dr. E.O. Wilson, who will take the lead in giving his thoughts. Um, and actually, Dr. Wilson will do the introductions of the other members of the panel. Um, Dr. Wilson, I'm sure as all of you know, teaches at Harvard University. He's a two-time Pulitzer Prize winner, acclaimed scientist, and soon-to-be-published novelist. His novel, Ant Hill, is in production almost. It will be out in about a year. About a year, okay. Um, we could spend a lot of time talking about Dr. Wilson's accomplishments. He's been described in many ways, but in all honesty, I think the single best and most apt description is one that I read in a newspaper article last week that describes him simply as a hero of the planet. Um, this university is going to be honoring Dr. Wilson this afternoon. I'm sure all of you are aware of this. He will be presented with the MSU Presidential Medal in ceremonies that begin at the Field House at 1.30 p.m. Um, and these ceremonies will include a lecture by Dr. Wilson commemorating the Darwin Bicentennial. Um, I'm hoping all of you can attend. Um, my advice is to arrive early, and I'm saying this because I've been pre-alerted um, by my daughter's biology class at the high school that biology class classes are being canceled and students are being uh, made to march through rain and snow and sleet, come whatever weather to get to this event. So you will see a parade of um, younger students arriving at the very last minute, um, huffing and puffing and out of breath. So just so everyone knows what's going on, plus I understand there are several buses of students coming from the Belgrade schools as well. So if you would like um, good seats for this, um, do try to get there a little bit early. So uh, let me say something about our order of proceedings this morning. Um, as I told you a few minutes ago, our subject, our topic is the human prospect. Um, it's broad enough um, to make pessimists and optimists among you equally happy. Um, if you're an optimist, you should be pleased. If you're a pessimist, you should be pleased. There's lots to think about. Um, and one of the other things um, I should tell you is that I've invited our distinguished panelists to reflect for a few minutes about this subject. Um, spend four or five minutes here at the podium in the microphone um, really talking about their thoughts about the human prospect. And as I've told them, um, the one hallmark of being distinguished is the ability to say profound things briefly. So they're all stuck with a very short time limit. Um, after their comments, I'm going to turn the proceedings over to a group of students seated here in the front row. Um, they're going to be introduced to you by Sadie Tyne. Sadie, why don't you stand up for a minute? Um, join me in welcoming Sadie. She's the student president of Phi Kappa Phi. Um, and she'll be introducing the other students a bit later on. Um, and we'll give the students a chance for a little bit of give and take, and then we'll see how we're doing on time. We do need to wrap this up um, in about an hour, about 11.15. And if we have time for some other questions, we'll try to do that. Um, but I think rather than take up any more of our time with my speaking, what I'd like to do is turn it over to Dr. Wilson. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Wilson and the other members of the panel. Thanks so much. 
Thank you for joining us here uh, for this discussion, which is likely to be as helpful for us uh, as it is to you. You're very fortunate to be at a small but first-rate university. I know this is my second visit here. You have exciting people on the faculty and a, an atmosphere uh, for a fine liberal arts education as well as training. Uh, now, um, I think that in discussing the human condition, it is always best uh, to remember that we need to know or find out uh, the solutions to the great problems facing us, meltdown, environmental degradation, and restoration, the latter being the subjects that uh, will be treated primarily by this distinguished group this morning. Not just the problems, though, but why there are problems. What is the source of these problems? And it is here that we turn from science and technology into the humanities and the connections to be made between the two. I think the starting point, it's a very difficult starting point, and yet it is extraordinarily simple and it's heuristic. That is to say, it promotes discussion in the process of discovery. To start with um, the what can be called the fundamental existential questions of philosophy. Now before you start getting uh, nervous and looking at your watch, you're not going to get here philosophy today. But these are, they are the three questions inscribed upon the canvas of Paul Gauguin's Tahitian masterpiece. Where did we come from? What are we? Where are we going? Now that is what a great liberal arts and university education can help you ponder. And what scholars of all fields and stripes knowingly or unknowingly are beginning to, uh, beginning to answer. Science, particularly as it comes close to the humanities and joins hands, uh, collaborates, uh, has some prospect of answering those great questions in this century and during your lifetime. In fact, we'd better answer them because we really have to find solutions to problems that our deep nature has engendered. And it was expressed, these problem, this, this aspect of it was expressed very well uh, by a later French writer, Vercors was his author's name, his, uh, his uh, nom de plure. Uh, he, uh, his real name was uh, Jean Brulé, and he said, all of man's troubles come from the fact that we do not know what we are and cannot agree on what we want to become. Now, uh, the screwed up nature of uh, human existence today, the human prospect, uh, also I like to summarize it by saying uh, that uh, we are in a Star Wars civilization. That's, you know all know the Star Wars series. And in fact, it was uh, the, 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 the plots and the characters were really kind of intuitively formed uh, from this conception of what the kind of civilization is we live in. Uh, we are um, a civilization with Stone Age emotions, medieval institutions, and godlike technology. Now that is an extraordinarily dangerous, uh, that's, that's, that's a very dangerous combination, and it's one that we somehow got to sort out. Uh, then I'll conclude and then mention, because I want to say a word or two about uh, each of our uh, distinguished guests. And um, the, um, uh, by, by saying that the division between the great branches of learning, 
uh, that have uh, been recognized since uh, the Middle Ages. Uh, the uh, natural sciences, although they didn't have that word, they didn't have science in the in the phrasing. The, s the natural sciences, social sciences, humanities. These are divisions which, and now this year, incidentally, we're celebrating, uh, celebrating, recognizing perhaps uh, the uh, Charles uh, Snow uh, uh, famous uh, 1959 Reed lecture, in which he said that a lot of our problems in education and self-understanding of everything else uh, is comes from the fact that there's this deep chasm between the great branches of learning. And I think what we're beginning to understand, I've written on this extensively in my book, Consilience, uh, is that uh, this is not a natural barrier. It's not uh, some kind of a deep epistemo epistemological division that will never be bridged. Uh, it is not a Hadrian's wall, uh, Dr. Rydell, I hope would agree with me, uh, that Hadrian's wall bit, you know, to, built to keep the barbarians of science out of the sacred preserves of the humanities. Uh, rather that it is a broad and unexplored domain of, uh, of, uh, in which there are phenomena, mostly having to do with the mind and human origins uh, and uh, ways of understanding how our mind work, how our civilizations are built, how our uh, you know, how our cultures are evolved. Uh, uh, this broad area still between these, dome, uh, these great branches of, of learning um, are uh, beginning to be bridged. They await the cooperative uh, contributions from both sides of the, uh, of the area. Uh, there are subjects like uh, genetics, and cognitive uh, psychology from both sides, anthropology from uh, modern anthropology, uh, uh, neuroscience, um, evolutionary theory, and so on, that are beginning to, to build tenuous bridges. And those are, those are the ones worth watching. Our guest, uh, the, uh, my fellow guests here uh, are, uh, 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 will have, I think, the um, capacity among them to um, talk about one of these great bridging areas, and that has to do with the um, the, the major environmental problems facing us, how we got to them, and what they are in detail, and uh, maybe a little bit uh, ensuing from the discussion uh, about the best way to uh, approach them. Uh, on the um, second uh, from uh, your right, uh, uh, Dr. Um, Ignacio uh, Rodriguez Iturbe is one of the world's foremost hydrologists, expert on water. And I won't say anything more about that except to point out that it's always been clear to me, and I think most ecologists, that the, um, the, the crunch point immediately facing us around the world is water shortage and the proper manage of water. So uh, we, we need desperate help and advice from those who are most expert on where the water is, uh, how, it, uh, how it is affected, how it affects the Earth's crust, uh, how it harbors life, and how it harbors our life, and how best to manage it. Uh, Dr. Running, who is the, uh, on your, the third, uh, the second from your right, uh, yeah, right, is uh, from the University of uh, Montana. You may have heard of that over in Missoula. Uh, and uh, is, um, has the uh, distinction of uh, being one of our leading authorities on uh, big scale monitoring of climatic and other changes of the Earth's surface. And he played a leading role in the, um, the World Climate Research Program, the IPCC, Intergovernmental Program for Climate Change, and that is now a major force in our thinking about the human prospect, is how we're going to 
deal with the rapid climate change we have brought about. There is no longer any doubt among experts um, that, uh, that this is occurring and that we need to take full control of it uh, and do the best with it we can. There are only two remaining experts who um, have serious doubts about whether we have this climate change, and they are Rush Limbaugh and Bozo the Clown. Um, <clears throat> Dr. Uh, Michael Sule, on your far right, an old friend and colleague, uh, is a world authority on biological diversity and conservation science. He's one of the founders of conservation biology uh, and um, is uh, known for many innovations and many new ideas, which at first, even to me, seem uh, pretty far out, but quickly begin to come in and settle in the mind and now begin to look like real necessities. They are, they include uh, the, uh, the Wildlands Project, the Continental Spine Project, uh, which are uh, absolutely needed, not just in America, but worldwide, uh, to um, vouchsafe the future of uh, the rest of life. And I won't go into the uh, uh, details of that. And then finally, there is your own uh, Dr. David Ward on the, your far left. Uh, who is um, uh, one of our leading world experts and researchers on microbial ecology. I concluded my uh, my autobiography 12 years ago or 13 years ago by saying uh, if I had to do it, had the opportunity to do it all over again, I was your age, I would become uh, a uh, microbial e ecologist and probably end up here studying under Professor David Ward. Uh, his, his work in the Yellowstone among the extremophiles and uh, all the peculiarities of extreme uh, adaptation of organisms uh, at the genetic and physiological level at path breaking and with that. Should I, int no, I, why don't you resume the, uh, okay, well, okay, I am sort of took over here and I didn't mean quite to do that. Uh, so I'll just start on this side and, and ask uh, 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 Dr. Soule, Michael Soule to say a, a few words. Thank you very much, Ed. It's a great pleasure to be here again. I've been to the campus many times and had many friends go through their faculty ranks here and either retire or die. <laughs> Not many have actually died. Um, as Ed said, the question of the human prospect ultimately comes down to the question of who we are. Of, our, of human nature, and Ed has written a book on human nature, and uh, many people try to do that uh, towards the usually towards the end of their careers. Ed uh, was smart and tried to do it in the middle of his career. Uh, but if you're trying to understand where where we've come from and where we're going, it's really all about human nature most of which was constructed during hunter-gatherer times. As an ecologist, it's only been, on average, about five or 6,000 years. And some people in the world are still in that phase of human development, if that's what it is. So it's just been an instant in ecological or geological time. So we're forced to go back and see why why we behave the way we do. And there hasn't been anything really exciting as, uh, about, this, about the feel of human nature until fairly recently, partly as a result of the development of the idea of sociobiology. One of its manifestations is evolutionary psychology or mo modern neurobiology. Uh, and a lot of that is based on uh, functional magnetic resonance imaging where we can now actually see something that was thought not to exist when I was a student, when I was your age. There were no human instincts. We were born as tabula rasa, with, uh, as blank slates. And now the pendulum is swinging over completely to the other side and we keep finding more and more evidence for uh, genetically based 
instinctual behavior patterns that can be actually observed uh, with fMRIs. So it's really a huge shift, but it, it does allow us a window, not the only win window into our human nature. Because if you're somebody like me who really cares about nature and wants to save nature or save the world, and that's what our world is, is nature, part of it anyway, then you have to go back and ask, well, uh, what is it about us that's stopping us? What is it about us that's causing war and causing uh, the kinds of, of uh, suffering we see throughout the world in human beings and in animals and in ecosystems? Certainly population is one of those things, which gets me to the point that I'll end with more or less. Academics never end, really. <laughs> And that is, when people ask me, well, what are we going to do about population? Isn't it the most important problem? And I say, well, it's certainly one of the most important problems because it greatly exacerbates everything we're trying to do. And uh, the answer I always give is, we've known for 20, 25 years now how to solve the human population problem. It's simple. It's opportunity for women. And, and all we have to do is give women educational opportunities, employment opportunities, opportunities to shine. And when, when nations, when civilizations do that, then it's amazing what happens. One of which is the birth rate immediately plummets from four or five or six children per female to one or two, immediately. I mean, within a generation. The problem is, though, that there are many cultures in the world that are based on, re on suppressing women, many cultures. And we can name the continents that are dominated by those cultures. So what it means is if, if we want to give women opportunities, it means destroying many cultures because the patterns are so deeply embedded in these cultures to suppress women that to overcome those patterns means destroying those cultures and those religions, those orthodox fundamentalist religions that maintain that pattern. So uh, it puts you in a difficult position because if you want to give opportunities for women, you have to go around destroying many cultures. And that's not politically correct, is it? <laughs> So that's one of the reasons I'm called a Cassandra by some of my friends. But it is the way out, and it's one of the only ways out, I think, for, for, for the human enterprise, the human prospect. I think that's probably a, a good way to end. Thank you. Thank you for that very... Thank you for that rather timid. <laughs> He's famous for that, but there's a lot of truth in it. Anyway, I now call on uh, Dr. Rodriguez Iturbe. Thank you. Thank you, Ed, and thank you all for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be here, especially among the students. Is this working okay? Yeah. Um, as Ed mentioned, I am a hydrologist. I deal with water, and uh, in my five or six minutes, I'm, I tend to run easily, much larger than that, so part of my human nature, so call me to order, please. Uh, um, I want to focus on two things, you know. Uh, one is uh, in, in the problem of development and so on, how we define water, and water for me is the keystone for sustainable development. I really mean that. If, uh, you know, more than any other thing, I think where it, uh, it's going to control a lot of the problems of sustainability in the near future and the medium future, uh, not to talk about the long range type of thing, is going to be water. And uh, water has, uh, uh, you know, a thousand times of connections and relationships. We all know that without water, there is no life. But when you start thinking and getting more and more into research into what water is, and uh, just to take two very large aspects of the problem. One is, you know, the, the equation between water and food, and the other one is the equation between water in nature and ecosystems. You can immediately see that one cannot exist without the other. In terms of, 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 of problems of the world, if you want to call it that way, you know, even in problems that are in the New York Times front page every day, water in one way or another plays a fundamental key role. When you 
to, to take a province of the Middle East or, you know, just take uh, things like, uh, you know, the different different nations with different resources, et cetera, et cetera. And the, and the, the, the fundamental role that water plays in those, as an example, you know, Turkey and Israel until several years ago had this, this, this wonderful interchange of water coming in ships to Israel and Israel exporting tanks and military technology. And they are not precisely, you know, body bodies in terms of political, foreign policy and all that, but water makes a lot of the things to happen. Without going to other places in the world, in the United States, you have Las Vegas growing like crazy, you know, in a place where there's no water, it's not sustainable. The, 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 the Colorado River was a portion between seven states, it, uh, using data for a period in which it was running way above average, those last 30 years in which they are, and, and it was not done in percentage, it was only in liters and cubic meters per second. So, uh, there is not enough water to warranty what was given to every state. What's going to happen? In this country, there is a hope that those tensions will be alleviated by, you know, courts of justice, Supreme Court, uh, conversations among the states, and so on. When you go to the international scene, the things start to change, and change dramatically. Typically, you can say that 70% goes to agriculture or water, 30%, 20% goes to industry, 10% goes to, goes to, goes to uh, use, domestic use. Those numbers are being changed quickly. And as I say, the, the equation water and food then becomes absolutely key for survival of civilization. Take China as an example, just as we were talking about that, until recently China, I mean, China didn't need to import any grains. The big push for industrialization, which has been great in many, many, in many aspects, in regards to the income of the middle class and things like that, has had terrible consequences in terms of pollution. Some of the rivers doesn't make to the sea, or some of the big, big rivers of the world don't make it to the sea anymore. Are just open sewages tricking, tricking down, the, down the streams. But worse than that, also, well, as bad as that, China is importing grain, in this case, from the United States. Uh, this, this type of problems keep going and going and going. How are they going to be solved? What kind of science has to be developed by your generation in order to bring light into a rational solution to these problems, which are crucial? When you talk with students or headmasters of schools in Ethiopia, and you know that there are schools of girls in this case in which two liters of water, two liters, are given to every student in the morning and say, that's what you have for eat, drinking, washing and cleaning your clothes and you realize that when you eat a kilogram of beef you indirectly consume 15,000 liters of water in order to cut the grass you know the cow the, the whatever you know and, uh, and you know the, 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 the difference are enormous the problem of nutrition passes through the problem of water and the problem of ecosystems passes through the problem of water I mean most of, some of the most beautiful ecosystems and more riches of the world are river basins river basins are controlled by the water and by the structure of how the water flows in those the drainage network we cannot talk about the biodiversity in a river system without talking in how Water moves that biodiversity in terms of seeds, proper use, or fishes in a network, and how the habitat capacity is controlled by the amount of water and nutrients that are taken by the rivers. How these things come into play is a new frontier in science. Wonderful, really exciting. I guess I am already over my six minutes. And that is open to your generation. I really believe, you know, that you have a magnificent, magnificent future in science ahead of you, and I wish you the best, best luck. Thank you. We're scaring you. <laughs> what you came to university to do mm -hmm. is to be scared, see what's going on, and then prepare to do something about it. And I don't think that Dr. Running is going to uh, that, uh, is going to uh, change that scenario very much. <laughs> well, you're exactly right. Is this on? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yes, I'm from the enemy camp down the down the freeway. Uh, I I came to Missoula in 1979 as an assistant professor, and I had been trained as a typical field ecologist and did my PhD on lodgepole pine trees, but. As I got to Missoula, there was an, an early awakening uh, that we needed to start studying the entire planet. 
And so I had the good fortune of being in the front row seat for the, the dawn of global ecology science. And so I, I very rapidly decided that rather than studying a small ecosystem, I wanted to study uh, the entire global ecosystem, the, the biosphere. And so uh, to fast forward from then to now, uh, our lab measures photosynthesis of the whole world every day. And in fact, in about an hour, the satellite will go over for today's measurement and uh, we calculate every place on Earth, 110 million cells uh, every day, their photosynthetic activity. And the only lab in the world that does that. Now, why would we bother doing that? The global carbon cycle is really the, the fundamental problem that we now have with our future. We are imbalancing the global carbon cycle uh, dramatically with every additional uh, ton and gigaton of fossil fuel we burn. And so we now have to study our Earth as a whole uh, to understand the perturbation we are having on this global system and the global carbon cycle to realize the impact that fossil fuel uh, combustion is having on that carbon cycle which then feeds to our climate cycle. And so our Earth system models that uh, integrate this carbon cycle with Ignacio's water cycle, you can't understand the carbon cycle without simultaneously understanding the water cycle. And those feed to our nutrient cycles, ultimately the energy budget of the planet, and that's where our climate comes from. And so this study uh, that started 30 years ago is, is now the middle of the science of trying to figure out where our climate is going and particularly how we're going to rebalance the global carbon cycle to stabilize our climate. And this really is a, a classic computing exercise. The biggest computers of the world uh, outside the military that we don't know about go er with every new generation to the climate modeling teams because modeling the global, global climate system is what we have to understand and uh, and have to uh, follow for seeing where, where humanity is going. Having said that, and given, given our, our pep talk to the climate science, I'd have to say that in many of the public lectures I give around Montana, I try to end with the point that we as climate scientists have almost done, I shouldn't say all we can, but we've provided sufficient evidence of where humanity's going that it's now up to the social scientist to try to understand how to motivate humanity to do what needs to be done. Because we as climate scientists seem to be good at uh, drawing new graphs with more points going up and up, but we don't seem to be very good at understanding how to motivate the public. And I think that's exactly what has to happen right now and literally in the next few weeks some of the most critical uh, climate uh, bills ever put in front of the U.S. Congress are going to be argued. And so we are right now exactly at the critical point of our national politics of what we're going to do uh, about climate change in the future. I think that's all you need to hear from me now. <laughs> Dr. Ward uh, is an expert on what's going to be left of life if we screw up. <laughs> <laughs> well, th thanks, Ed, for the lead-in and also for the kind remarks that you made. Uh, it's really an honor to be sitting here with these esteemed people in this panel. Um, you know, I took a poll because we were charged by George last night, late in the evening, to go home and get a good night's sleep, but to think about the problem of the, the human prospect. 
And, and I thought, oh yeah, we're going to get some sleep now. <laughs> well, I, I did, and I got some sleep because I took a poll. So I asked my wife what she thought the human challenge was, and, and she said, overcoming a lack of empathy. And then I asked my daughter uh, what her, uh, her thoughts were, and, and she said, overcoming a lack of compassion. And then I asked my colleague Don Bryant from Penn State uh, what he thought, and he said, well, if you really want to push to the wall, you could say religion and greed. But I, I think all of these relate to the kinds of things that you, you've been hearing about, about the problem of human nature. And I, I think you know what, what was first on my list, the way I phrased it, was overcoming anthropocentrism. And, and actually, Ed has said this really nicely in his writing, that you know we now know, and we can we can know quantitatively, that that humans are really nothing special, that we're just one of the millions, billions probably, of endpoints on the tree of life, and that's really all we are. Now we we have some phenotypes that are unique to us that that are. Are, are different from from other biological entities at the at the tips of the of the tree of life, the periphery of the tree of life, if you will. You know, we have bigger brains, and you know, the question I think is uh, regarding human nature: Is this going to help us or hurt us in the end, in terms of our ability to uh, be one of the the lineages that continues to survive? or whether we're going to be one of the majority of lineages that apparently aren't, aren't good enough at maintaining their understanding or their interaction with the, their, their niches, with their environments, to, uh, to not go extinct. So, you know, I thought about this through the years. I'm not really very profound, I think, in my thinking about this, but, but, but I, I, for a while I thought, you know, maybe another coming of a Messiah would, would be something that would grab everybody's attention. But clearly, we're not going to agree if that happens. We're not going to agree on the importance of that event. You know, I, I really like this movie that I saw when I was a kid called The Day the Earth Stood Still. And if you've ever had a chance to see that, it's like, you know, it's like the, the, the people from somewhere else come here and tell us, you better get it straight or we're not going to let you continue. It reminds me of Douglas Adams, too. You wake up one day and somebody's going to bulldoze your planet because got to get it out of the way. We're building a, a big you know, uh, intergalactic superhighway. <laughs> so I, my thoughts here are, are, are largely uh, uh, just ideological, and I'm, I'm not sure that, that they help all that much. But, but I think in terms of trying to overcome anthropocentrism, uh, again, we have to realize, and, and I love how this was said. It was said in an ecology book written by Bay and Harper and Townsend in their introductory material. The, the, and they were referring to a bird, and they said that, the, that the, the current distribution and activity, and I would add even the existence of this bird, is the product of the ecological struggles of its ancestors. And this speaks loudly to the connections of biodiversity uh, and, and environment. And, and I think that, you know, so we are a product of what our prehistory was in an evolutionary sense. But I, I think that we are also a product of our, of our sociological history, the development of cultures. We've heard a lot about that. And I think, you know, of the, I think of the comment that was made by Stephen Covey in his book on the seven habits of highly effective people, that, you know, we, given this context that we are who, who we became because of our prehistory, that um, we can either be constrained by that or we can decide that we're not going to be constrained by that. And what Covey says is that you need to evaluate what you were given by your parents that makes sense for continuing into the future and, and throw away the rest. So I don't have the magic answer, but those are the thoughts that I was stimulated to think after George presented this enormous challenge. Uh, I'll just add one more plug for, uh, for the microbial world that Steve mentioned that, that we need to understand the, the global carbon cycle as a whole, and half of the Earth's biodiversity and carbon cycling is, is in the microbial world, and so half of the biodiversity on our planet 
is in a category that we, we just don't really know very well. And I'll just sum it up quickly by saying this is the land of opportunity if you're a biologist. And if you don't believe me, just go read Ed's books. <laughs> Thank you. Hello, um, once again, my name is Sadie Tynes. Um, we are very excited to see you all here today. Um, and as Dr. Rydell said, we do have a panel of students um, with us here that are going to ask questions of our distinguished guests. So I'm gonna introduce them if they could stand up um, when I introduce them. Um, Olin Robus. Olin is a graduate student um, studying philosophy of science with emphasis on philosophy of biology and evolution. He is currently a research associate with the MSU Astrobiology Research Center focusing on conceptual and theoretical problems with definitions of life. Matt Smith. Matt is a junior in business who's worked on issues of envi environmental sustainability on campus, within the community, and on the federal level. He's on the MSU ethics team, has minors in religious studies and English, and will be working with local nonprofits this summer to develop environmentally based curriculum for Montana clergy. Katie Baldwin. Katie is a senior studying history and modern languages. She is passionate about international work and policy. She is currently working part time at Senator John Tester's field office. Kevin Landy. Kevin is a graduating senior, senior and honors student, double majoring in philosophy and political science. Kevin is on the MSU Ethics Bowl team and has studies, studied philosophy of mind, language, and science. And Michael Barton. Michael is a first year graduate student in the Department of History and Philosophy. He's interested in the history of science and works with a few others in his department on the John Tyndall Correspondence Project. Tyndall, a 19th century physicist, is also the subject of his master's research, specifically the various ways in which he supported Darwin's theory of evolution. So these are our student panelists here with us today. Um, I'm gonna open it up for questions from them and I think Katie has our first one. Thanks for coming, um, <laughs> and the audience. Um, I think most of us aspire to learn in this new domain that you were talking about, this area between the humanities and the sciences. And I'm wondering how we actually go about creating a university where students can learn in that area. One of my professors suggested mandating a double major in a science and a humanities um, subject, but I was wondering what curriculum or organizational adjustments you would suggest to set us on this path. Well, I guess I got stuck with that one. That's right. <laughs> I think the best way to, um, I, I, you're quite right. I mean, we've really got to think about restructuring everything, uh, including our economic system, including uh, our defense strategy, everything. And so why not universities? And I believe that that will be worked out um, institution by institution according to what it starts with and uh, its basic philosophy and um, what uh, directions it wants to take in specific study program. But a serious problem here is uh, the uh, the conceptualization, which we're just beginning to get, of the relation between the sciences and the social sciences and humanities. And uh, I believe that we have to accept that um, the natural sciences are pretty close to being uni unified in cause and effect, a network of cause and effect explanation. They are consilient all the way from, well, particle physics, which is, you know, it's in turmoil itself, yet on a macro level, uh, it uh, is pretty solidly connected uh, in, uh, in, in, in causal explanation to uh, traditional physics that then leads on to the remainder of the physical sciences. Uh, but when we, and that continues, I think through virtually all of biology now, 
But when we get to the social sciences, there's that gap. And I believe that in considering uh, the um, human prospect and, and the connection that that that, um, uh, the, um, uh, that the, the between the branches of learning that uh, it, it understanding necessitates, we have to recognize, um, as Dr. Sule I think noted, that basically this comes down to understanding the mind. That's the great mystery. That's the that is the citadel, Darwin called it long ago, that cannot be taken by direct assault. Uh, it's required all sorts of science, all sorts of studies from the humanities on into the sciences, and still it is an inchoate, uh, 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 early, uh, an early stage of formation, uh, the science of the mind. We're moving rapidly in that direction, but it appears to me that um, any university uh, uh, and any program of uh, philosophy will have to focus substantially on that particular problem. Uh, and the intermediate area that uh, solving it will begin to fill in more effectively between the great branches of learning. So uh, if you wanted to, um, uh, if <clears throat> I would, uh, if I were a university president, I think I would immediately resign complaining gallstones. <laughs> but if I were forced to continue, I, I think I would give serious consideration to building. It could be initially through uh, special research programs, institutes, getting really first class people working in this area. I would start uh, adding to what already there in the university, um, a program devoted specifically to the science of the mind with special reference to the great philosophical questions and of these uh, and of human behavior as they relate to the crises that this century has revealed to us so graphically. I'd like to add just a little bit to what Ed was saying. Uh, although your question is about science and, and social science, uh, we have a small example of, of the problem right here in front of you today. Uh, if we just narrow our thinking down to biology, uh, it might surprise you to learn that Ed is the only person on this panel that I've ever met before, even though we have noted ecologists here. Uh, I'm a microbiologist. And microbiology and biology actually have diverged and have become uh, these sort of separate lineages, if you will, uh, of, of study. And, and this is another example of, of overcoming our prehistory. We need to get past that point. Uh, we need to, uh, to bring biologists back together so that we can study all organisms in principled ways uh, and, and, and create 21st century biologists who can work uh, better. Now, Ed was right. You take baby steps within institutions. Uh, I actually was kind of uncomfortable after 23 years in the microbiology department here, and I actually had an opportunity to move to the Land Resources and Environmental Sciences Department, where my colleague Bruce Maxwell, the weed ecologist, said, oh, we do the same thing. You just work with really little weeds. And he's, he's basically right, because we're taking a principled view of both little and, and big organisms. Uh, the problem is, though, that because of this prehistory, this divergence, people who work with big organisms don't really understand the little ones. I, I love Ed's phrase, no more big organism chauvinism. You know, but but by the same token, in this on this campus and pretty much everywhere, there aren't any microbi microbiology curricula that ask their students to take courses in evolution and ecology. And this is a kind of a, a, a surprising thing. It's as if microbiologists have been trained to think of these things as not even being biological, these objects of their study. And, and so, you know, we need to do better than this. What we've done here in the context of the LRES department is design a curriculum where the microbiologist has given up the word microbiology. It's called environmental biology. But we ask our students to understand principles and to apply them to both the big and the little organisms. I'm going to produce a little bit of discussion here. 
<laughs> because uh, I do agree with what we have been saying, but I think this type of thing has been said for a long, long, long time. The need about to, how to get the interdisciplinary, which is what we are talking about, is a challenge for universities. I think it's a challenge for the administration of universities. It's a challenge for the faculty of universities. Uh, one, I mean, uh, I guess uh, I am the less biology inclined of all the whole panel. Okay. Being more in the physical science, being a hydrologist myself, well, I do have a joint appointment with CEB in, in Princeton, but uh, I am I am more in, in, into the physical science, and uh, and. Uh, you see, if you think that is a division, um, I'm sorry, some kind of uh, uh, of problem between ecology and molecular biology, in which there is not a lot of communication, which is true, although now has become better and better with time, you you will pale to see what lack of communication exists between you know uh, geosciences and eco real communication and ecology and biology. I mean, it's, it's 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 very appalling. One way to go about those things is to. You know, it's for the administration, a concrete way is to say, if, if I were the provost here, I'm not, I'm not looking for any provost appointment anywhere, God forbid. I will be a terrible provost. I will say, well, I, you don't appoint anyone to a department that doesn't have a joint appointment. So, you know, I give 50% or 25% to one, to one department, another 25% of the department, and find the person. I myself, I only have an engineer in 25% of my appointment. The other 75% is distributed I don't know where. I choose to remain into environmental engineering because I like very much the students' environmental engineering. I have a very quantitative background. I, 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 you know, I express myself in mathematics. I believe in that, in that sense of expression. But these are bridges that have to be built. I have to be built through the students, but with faculty that moves, if not with the same ease in different disciplines, at least with enough uh, comfortable feeling to know what people is talking about. And you were right, you know, how many uh, uh, ecologists read hydrology uh, uh, journals, how many hydrologists read ecology journals, how many hydrologists go every month to ecology or to American naturalist or nature and read it, and how many ecologists and biologists do the otherwise. Until we get this going, it will not happen, in my, in my opinion. And the way to make it going is forcing it from above through joint appointments. You don't give the appointment until the two appointments agree that this is the type of person we want. Okay, I think our next question is from Michael. Dr. Wilson, in your autobiography, you recalled that while at the University of Tennessee in the 1950s, you were, quote, intrigued by the fact that a statute was still on the books forbidding the teaching of evolution in the state. Although that statute was repealed in 67, evolution has not yet escaped controversy. I'd like to know your thoughts with your many decades in biology on the continuing controversy of evolution education and for the rest of the panel as well. Thank you. I'll try to be brief uh, because uh, we want to have the questionnaire, the questioner's time to ask questions too. Uh, and uh, it was, um, I, I was raised a Southern Baptist. Uh, I, I know evangelicalism very well. Uh, and I understand the problems that um, uh, have been caused by 50% or so of Americans re rejecting the very idea of evolution. So, incidentally, in Muslim countries it varies between two-thirds and three-fourths of the population. Um, and um, uh, I have uh, taken a course of action that, first of all, um, makes plain my own personal belief uh, in secular humanism, meaning that I do not believe in a um, personal God involved in human affairs. I do not believe in the creation myths of the various religions around the world. I think we're beginning to develop a better story by uh, the great, and uh, by the most powerful tool that humanity has developed to date uh, in securing, testing, and spreading truth. Uh, uh, that is what we can understand of the real world. Yet, uh, having uh, arrived at that, I have not taken personally an adversarial position. I have uh, realized that we really have to um, uh, work together and fast 
in countries, whether they believe, the majority believe or disbelieve in one thing or another produced by science, uh, we can put that aside for a while and argue about it uh, in ways that I think are non-destructive. And if we find transcendent issues in which we all believe, regardless of what we think about the origins of those uh, those uh, moral precepts. And that's why I wrote the book, The Creation, uh, which is addressed to everybody about the problems of diversity and destruction of the living world, but is specifically addressed to a religious audience because in this country, which makes n has knife edge uh, uh, political uh, contest, so that our political leaders are afraid to speak out during their campaigns about any serious issue. Uh, that the best way is to say, as I said in the imaginary uh, Baptist preacher that I uh, addressed, uh, we understand each other, we have fundamentally different worldviews, but let's get together as colleagues and friends to address the kind of transcendent issue of uh, saving humanity, and in my case, I emphasize saving the rest of life. And that works. I've met with the leadership of the, I mean, it works to a degree, not as much to really get a revolution going, but I've met with leaders of the evangelical movement with the Mormon church, and uh, just personally, and I know others have done likewise, and there are movements within the different denominations uh, in this country, uh, for example, that are now ex stepping up uh, to address the issue of uh, environment and conservation. Okay, Olin. Uh, thank you all for being here. Um, in your book, The Creation, Dr. Uh, Wilson, uh, you make reference to a seemingly pretty commonly held notion uh, among most people, uh, this distinction between nature and man. Um, and um, I'm interested in um, all the panelists' uh, response to um, how this distinction plays a role in the current crises we are now experiencing of climate and ecology. Thank you. Would you repeat the last part of that, please? Um, what uh, role does this distinction between nature and man play in our current crises um, of climate and ecology? Uh, yeah, it's, uh, the, uh, the role is important. It's all important. In other words, we uh, have, have not recovered from the view that is um, archaic that, and, and was rebutted uh, by my colleague next to me, uh, that um, in some way we are dark angels uh, uh, living upon the earth in, in, in an environment that is essentially endless and given to us by the, by the deity, and that we are here to uh, prosper and to make full use of the gifts given to us from above with the grace and the blessing of the Creator who, uh, who, who, who set, set all this up for us. And when you take that sort of uh, attitude and you overlook the, the obvious evidence before you that we are a biological species, that's what Darwin's revolution was all about, um, and uh, that we are part of that biosphere, that razor-thin uh, membrane uh, over the Earth's surface, totally adapted to it, physically, mentally, uh, and that we are destroying it uh, almost in disregard, and particularly in the evangelical view that uh, this is just a stopover in which we'll be checked out uh, on our virtues and on whether we selected the right religion and whether we selected the right version of the right religion and whether we declared our all lasting, our everlasting allegiance to that particular part of that religion uh, and then uh, we then would be destined to move on to eternity uh, in some world beyond believing, uh, beyond our understanding that will nevertheless involve bliss 
And I don't want to sound like a rabble rouser of the left, but uh, I never quite fully understood, even when I was a practicing Southern Baptist, of um, what, what the justice was in after trillions of trillions of trillions of years have passed up there. Uh, and we, you know, we look down on the end of this universe and the birth of other universities, universes and then their birth and, divis and, and, and winding down and so on, that we were there because in one instant of time become infinitesimal, when distinguished from zero, that we were on one of those planets, we made the right decision as to religion. Participate a little bit on that myself. <laughs> uh, in the following sense, I do agree with part of the things that uh, it said. That in fact, uh, I don't. But uh, in other words, I will venture here that uh, I will express here my firm belief that I don't see a contradiction between religion and science. I do believe I see several of the panels that are studying philosophy and science. That uh, at the end of the day. There are fundamental questions that I will not, that's my opinion, is shared by many physicists too. I think the, the problem of the origin of the universe is much more in physics than in biology in many ways. Not evolution. I mean, we all believe in evolution. I mean, I'm sorry. We all here believe in evolution. <laughs> but uh, but uh, and, and, uh, and we all here agree with Darwin and many things. Now, with respect to the presence or absence of religion, I, I, I happen to be different than Ed, with whom I respect enormously. I do have a religious faith, and I practice that faith, and that doesn't at all violate or inhibit my scientific activity at all. And I do think that, uh, that there are questions which are more in the realm of the philosophy and at the end of the day, you know, I mean, even the, I mean the, there are things that, well, God knows if they will be solved or not, but time itself, the concept of time for those studying physics, the symmetry of time or the lack of symmetry of time, which is a very, to me, has been always a fascinating, uh, this the entropy thing has been a very fascinating point in my career. I tried to double with it on a certain moment, but it's a way above myself. But, uh, but, uh, but, uh, but uh, my point in this, in this thing is that, you know, one makes personal decisions, but I don't think a personal decision regarding the practicing of religion or non-practicing of religion has really a fundamental, a fundamental impact in the way that one practices science, at least in my practice of science. I do practice science, and I, I have a religion faith, and uh, I don't think it has ever in one of my papers or any of my attitudes in life or in academic life. You know, uh, I do understand that in many cases there are many people in which this is a mess. Not, I, I do believe, I, I, believe many, I, I know many scientists of, 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 uh, of especially physicists, there are many, many, many among my friends who, who, who will share this, uh, what, what I'm expressing right now. That's my personal point of view. Okay. I think Matt has our next question. Dr. Wilson, uh, your theories of sustainability uh, center on how we must act responsibly to ensure perpetuity, uh, which, hinge on the, which hinge on the assumption of an obligation of duty to our descendants and to creation. You present intriguing evidence for scientific approaches of how we must act, but what moral calculus must we consult to establish why? And I'll pose that to the board. Sure. I didn't understand that. Uh, sorry. Uh, I was saying that you present intriguing evidence for scientific approaches of how we act, of how we must act to continue okay. creation. Sustainable, yeah. Sure, right. but what moral calculus should we consult to establish why? Um, what is the moral basis of, uh, of saving humanity? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, you know, uh, I, I, I greatly appreciate um, uh, Professor Rodriguez uh, Echeverry's um, demural uh, because it's shared by a great many scientists, I, I, and I'm pleased that he did that. And um, I'd be curious uh, to, um, if he would volunteer the answer, it was just, just me, but volunteer the answer on um, 
moral precepts and how religion and science. Um, no, I'm not trapping. No, no, no. Forgive me, I'm not trapping you. But but I'd like to hear your view of uh, you know the uh, uh, the confluence perhaps of science and religion in terms of forming uh, moral precepts that relate to sustainability. Okay. Um, gee, this is a difficult one. Uh, <laughs> People who know me know that I'm very far from being a philosopher. I have children who have studied philosophy in depth. One of them has a PhD in philosophy, and others I'm very ignorant on this. But let me put it this way. I believe that there is something that is called natural law, OK? Without getting into what it is in depth, the concept of right or wrong is embedded. You know? But there are things in which I think we agree and in terms of sustainability, which I think was the question, I think you put it very well. The uh, one thing that I believe is embedded in all of us, or should be embedded in all of us, is a profound respect for the world that is around us. I mean, uh, uh, some people may think that the, that world arises from a creative act at the beginning, or so other people will not think that this is necessary or not. But uh, and there is room in there for these people to talk, not to fight. But what I do think that in all of us has to be a profound respect for this world in which we act. It's no, and not only because of the service that this world can give to us, which will be, I mean, a little bit, I don't know, it sounds to me like a bit selfish at the end of the day, okay? Uh, but a profound respect of what it means by itself. The world is beautiful. There is an inherent beauty in the world. And it's not only for the, from, from the point of view of the usefulness of biodiversity, which is an important one thing, and which you know you more than anyone will be ready to defend, and you know, uh, and all of us will share. But there is there is something more in there. I mean, it's like you know, I will defend the 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 the, the, the beauty of music and the need to have musicians, regardless of the utility of musicians, because it's part of our human nature. I believe that the world is around us. Part of us. I mean, it's, 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 it's not something that is there for us to take advantage of, but it's something in which we share as an intrinsic part of that world, and it's our moral responsibility, if you want to use moral, moral responsibility to take care of that. Not only because we have a, a, a duty with respect to the coming generation, which is through us, but even if that were not the case, even if we were the last generation, I will maintain we have it, a moral duty to keep it, you know, beautiful, to keep the species, to keep, to keep nature, you know, I mean, not to degrade nature in order to take advantage of it. I don't know if this deals with what you, you were asking me to. <laughs> You must Sorry. stack our microphone. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Working down there. There's, uh, I'd just like to follow that up with uh, what, what we might call perennial ecological and spiritual truths. And I say e ecological and spiritual because the same truths come out of spiritual traditions and ecological scientific traditions. The first one is do no harm which gets to sustainability. All religions, all artists who are interested in beauty, and, uh, and all spiritual people, all religious people would agree that that's a general precept of, of all of the major human traditions, do no harm. The second one is love one another, or love is God, if you want to look at it from a religious perspective. Or from a Buddhist perspective or Hindu perspective, um, it follows the third. The third one is, why should we uh, love one another? Because everything is connected. And that's, one, that's the foundation principle of ecology, and it's the foundation principle of all of the great spiritual traditions. We are all connected. So it, that sort of follows from what you said. I'd like to add that there's a, it's become very clear to us in the last 20 years that there's an incredible inequity globally in, in uh, the consumption of uh, Earth resources. I, I read one estimate that it would take seven Earths for everybody on the planet to live American lifestyle right now. 
and um, we now very clearly understand that, that Americans uh, are consuming uh, the, the global resources at a completely unsustainable rate. And so it becomes a, a particular moral imperative for Americans because we conspicuously, on every graph that I pull up of, of national consumption rates of just about every metric you use, we peg the meter. I just want to add a little bit to the idea of the connections in biology. And uh, I gave the impression earlier that, that we now can map out the diversity of life. And there are billions of endpoints to the tree of life. But all ecologists know that none of these exist by themselves. They all exist with other biology. So uh, I think that this is uh, uh, extremely important. And it goes right back to the question of who are we? We have to understand that we're one among billions of species. And we have to understand better how we interact with the rest of biology. And we're going to have one last question from Kevin. Um, thank you very much. It's been a very sort of exhilarating topics of discussion. Um, some of the common topics seem to be that this sort of distinction between nature and culture, man, um, isn't, doesn't hold much force, that they're all interconnected in these very complex sorts of ways, especially when you get to something like the mystery of the mind, which seems to um, interact between our natural instincts and our sort of social life. So my question is, what's the role of cultural and political institutions in shaping how our natural instincts play out? Um, is there any prospect for changing our sort of um, evolutionary natural instincts, which may be leading us to imbalance our ecosystem? Is there any way to change that through cultivating certain sorts of political institutions or cultural ways of life? Who is the most politically inclined person here? <laughs> you want to give it a shot? Yeah. Give it a shot. Yeah. <laughs> this, is a, this is the perennial question of why is it that our institutions century after century fail us to provide humanity with um, a way of living which does the least harm to ourselves and to the world. <coughs> and, you know, peop people have talked about democracy as being the highest form of political organization, and other people have said it's the least bad, but it's not working. It clearly doesn't work. It appeals, our institutions appeal to the lowest common denominator of ratiocination that we have in our societies. Uh, so that's one of the things that makes us you know, shake our heads because even the best human institutions we have today cannot cope with the rate of change of technology, the rate of change of culture. Uh, they're always decades behind. We're still not able to cope with nuclear weapons and nuclear waste, for example, just one among many. We have poverty and starvation and slavery and, and uh, abuse of women. I hate to end up that note. <laughs> uh, let me just add a coda, uh, a footnote to that, uh, and that is that um, as we uh, uncover our our origins more and more clearly. Um, we are beginning, I, I think most anthropologists would agree with this well, a great many would, uh, and historians even, perhaps. We're uncovering a very unpleasant truth about our species. It was actually articulated by Darwin. This guy was always so close to the target. And he said that it's quite possible that what we think of as the noblest and highest qualities of humanity were forged in an evolutionary arena of struggle between groups. Now, I don't want to complain, uh, compare uh, ants and other social insects uh, too directly with humans, but the picture that has emerged 
and I think more and more solidly about how they came about. And they were extremely slow in appearing and very, uh, they, uh, very rare as an event in evolution, just as humanity is, is uh, that it all came about by group against group, group against solitaire. That's the key, the driving force. And if that's true in human beings, then we would expect to find that throughout our history, uh, there would be group conflict as paramount and warfare and genocide common. And that is exactly what our history contains. Increasingly, it has become clear that prehistorical societies and existing hunter and gatherer societies are absolutely lethal. And that we in civilized, so-called civilized societies, um, continue war and genocide on all sides, but that we are much less so in most of the uh, the, the peoples of the world that uh, in the pre-literate and, and under hunter-gatherer and early agricultural societies. That is something that we've got to take into account. And there's a perfectly sound set of of, uh, of uh, population they call multi-level population genetic models to show how this could occur. Uh, and so if that is true, uh, then we need to find ways uh, not so much to spread a, a doctrine of love and fellowship, which is automatic to us within a group, as find a covenant between groups that embodies those uh, moral precepts that uh, my colleague here is just nicely, um, nicely uh, el el elucidated, and and find, in other words, study a, study the procedure of conflict resolution and covenant based upon understanding of our of our dark angels, the dark angels of our being, and realize that um, Homer had it right at the birth of of literacy. Uh, when in Ulysses he wrote, Zeus has decreed that we should unfold our lives in painful war from youth until we perish, all of us. And that is what we need to be thinking about and overcoming. Thank you all. Let me just bring this to close by thanking our students and thanking our distinguished guests, reminding you that at 1.30 we have the Presidential uh, Medal Ceremony coming up in the Field House, and later on this evening um, we will have a very special event as well where Ed's guests will be receiving the first ever E.O. Wilson Awards for Biodiversity. So again, my thanks to all of you. This has been a wonderful morning. Thank you so much. Thank you.